Good morning. It's the Driving School Podcast. I am Pastor Gibson. I'm the content executive here at Higher Things. And joining me today is uh, Pastor Jeremy Jacoby. Pastor, it's great to have you back. How are you doing? Doing great. Got a lot better weather than last time I was with you. Same here. You? It's like 95 degrees. It's, uh, um, it's, it's yeah, um, we just, we went zero to a hundred on it. And I'm okay <laughs> with that. Yeah, that's about us too. I actually flipped on the air conditioning for the first time this weekend and um, going to need it again today, I think. That's all right. That's, uh, I mean, summer's coming, school's almost out. Uh, but for right now, you are on the bus, I'm assuming, if you're listening to this. Uh, so Pastor Jacoby uh, and I have been talking about um, how to talk to your friends about tough issues. Um, and, and so we, we grab sort of a lot of the stuff that, that we know we believe, but how to talk about it with our friends is, is sometimes either scary or difficult. We're looking for the right language. And so we're obviously taking uh, just really low hanging fruit, simple stuff, uh, right? We, right. We, we tackled suicide last time. And uh, today let's, let's talk abortion. Uh, Pastor, how do I talk to my friends about abortion? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a really timely topic now because with um, the leaked court documents and um, uh, on the Roe v. Wade opinion, uh, you see lots of, um, Lots of concern about it from the community uh, that labels itself pro-choice. In fact, our church is next to a high school. And um, this week, as you drive by the, the intersection, there's some of the young ladies are out there with signs talking about my body, uh, my mind, my choice, which is interesting because um, I don't know where the my mind came from. This is a new, I hadn't really seen that as part of the, um, yeah. the slogan before and be curious to unpack their their brains a little bit on what they mean by that, but yeah, it's, it's really prevalent. Um, and it's, it's, uh, and yet it's still a difficult one to talk about. And so I guess the, the place I would start is when you're going to talk to your friends about this topic, you have to keep in mind that probably a lot of them are approaching it from a completely different background, right. Uh, uh, and a, a, um, a different angle at, at all, right. They're thinking about, um, the fact that, uh, as Americans, uh, we have uh, freedom to to do so many things that and controls what we do with our body. And so from their perspective, uh, you know, a woman's right to decide what to do with her body um, is a is extremely important right. And I think we that's something we could agree with them upon. But it would be, I think the most helpful would be to express to them from our perspective, from the biblical perspective, um, we believe that it is a life. Um, that at conception, God has begun to do something that is quite literally miraculous. Um, we're told in the in the God's word that um, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that's true for each and every single life um, on the planet. We also talk about it. Uh, God makes it clear in his word that um, God gives life, and it is up to him to take away life. And of course, he um, does delegate that to other agents, you know, um, throughout the world, right? This is why police armies, things like that can still, can still take a life. But as an individual, we don't really have that, um, have that right to take another person's life. And, um, and from our perspective, we apply that to, to the unborn. Right. So this is, um, I, I think maybe a helpful thing to, to begin the conversation with that. Um, it, it's not necessarily that it's, it's an entirely binary discussion. It's either you hate women and autonomy or, uh, you hate babies, uh, but, right. but maybe there could be a, a place where we can acknowledge that, you know what, autonomy is, is an important thing where we're not saying that, uh, th- that a, a woman's right to do what she wants with her body, uh, doesn't matter. But for us, uh, it, it's, it's a different beginning of a discussion over whether or not this is a person that God made a person right. that Christ redeemed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when you, when you think about it from that perspective, um, I think it, you know, it, it, it changes things. Um, the, a lot of the, um, science that's out there nowadays, a lot of, um, uh, people like to ignore, but, um, you've seen, uh, maybe you've seen it yourself, the, um, the incidences of what are essentially the same things as PTSD among women who choose to have an abortions. Um, yeah. the, the different rates of them are, are different depending on what you read, but it's, it's pretty high, right? There's, there's a lot of regret about it. Um, and I think that that's right. That's something that sort of demonstrates what we understand to be natural law, right? Even, even if you um, consciously are making a decision, you believe you have that right uh, as the mother to, to make that decision. I think there's stuff that's written in our hearts that um, maybe subconsciously they feel guilty about 
causes them some doubt. And that's why in this area, I think we always have to be t- careful talking about it. I know you and I, when we're in the pulpit, if we're preaching, we really got to be careful. But I think it also applies when we're having individual conversations is we don't talk about these people as if they're unredeemable, um, as if this sin is uh, unredeemable, if, this, if Christ didn't die for them and doesn't forgive them because he does as well. Um, so sometimes I think when in our efforts to uphold the sanctity of life, we often maybe unintentionally demonize the people who make a different choice. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. I mean, just the, the, the idea that the women who, who have been through this suffer from guilt, from shame, from genuine physiological uh, stress that comes from it. It's not just a point that we're right, but it, it sort of actually defines why we want to talk about it in the first place, that right. we actually want to offer compassion, the gospel, and, and, and God willing, a chance to, to sort of steer the ship away from hurting more. Um, it's, uh, I, I remember some of the most commented on sermons that, that I've ever preached. You, you say the words, your abortion is forgiven from the pulpit and people will come and talk to you afterwards. And, and yeah, yeah. You, I, I've always been kind of just grateful at, at how many people who have, have sort of said, this is the thing that Jesus died for. And, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. Yep. Yep. And, um, you know, of course we, we get into the topics of, um, uh, you know, there, there's always the issues of, of rape and incest. And um, one of the earliest I dealt with um, as a pastor was a young gal who's, who had a relative um, who actually uh, raped her um, and she did choose to have an abortion. And, and so whenever we would bring up and talk about the subject, it was very, very um, Visceral. difficult for her. Yeah. And, and I don't, I mean, I would, oh, I praise God. I would never, you know, not possible for me to be in her shoes, right? That just is an yeah. awful, awful, awful choice. And so, yeah, reminding her, talking to her about the fact that that she, you know, she is forgiven for it. Um, she still wrestled, I think, a lot with. She wanted. Um, it's like with a lot of things in our society, a lot of cultural things. There's a desire to have somebody in authority say what you chose to do is okay. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, we see this in some of the other issues that we'll probably talk about on some other drives. Um, but this one in particular, I think that's part of it. What's a little bit behind the uh, pro-choice movement is they you're dealing with women who want some authority to say to them, uh, what you did was, was right. And the problem is from, from our perspective, our biblical perspective is, um, that's not one of our goals. We don't, we're not looking for God to tell us what we did was right. We're looking for God to forgive us when we're not right. And, and so again, I think that's the hope to, to hold out. Um, but I also think it's, you know, it's a, it's a chance for us to talk about um, the sanctity of life. I think that's one of the troubling things in our society. And actually just even my, from my political view, I believe governments exist to protect the most vulnerable and the most vulnerable are the ones that are on the opposite ages of the of age spectrum, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the unborn and the, and the, the really, really okay. old and infirm. And our country is really moving to a point where too often uh, they're seen as having no value. Um, but the amazing thing that, that God says is uh, as, as he knit us, as he formed us, like he knew our days, he, he knew the things that he would do with us. And so um, his, the value he sees in us is literally infinite. Right. When we talk about sanctity of life, sanctity is a fancy word that just means holy. Um, right. And it's, it's important to sort of recognize that because if, it, if it's the sanctity of life means don't have abortions, uh, there's a limited scope of discussion. But if it's that life is, is more, it has value purchased with the blood of Christ, it means not only then for um, the, the infirm and, and uh, the unborn, but, but also for those who are struggling with guilt and shame. It means that when we talk about this, it stops being about winning and losing and, and even so much about am I right or am I wrong, but is there a value to life. And if there is, where do I find it? How do I get more of it? And, and that's where we actually do lean into Christ and, and his word. We, we lean into his promises and, and the things that he would give us there that actually stand shoulder to shoulder, right. everybody based on whether or not you're doing something or earning something or simply receiving something. But there is, there's a completeness in who you are in Christ, be you unborn working or too old to work. Yeah, right. And and to me, this kind of is um, it's a very modern um, illustration of some uh, something Luther said from our background. Um, a lot of times, it's misunderstood when they talk about him um, and his quote about sinning boldly. But um, 
for, from our biblical understanding, right, we actually believe that, that, that the result of the fall, the brokenness of this world, the sin in us and the sin in this world means that we should not only, not only can it happen, but we should expect quite often for it to happen where we are, we are given a choice between two things, both of which would, could be wrong, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. There's not always um, a God-pleasing answer in this, in this broken world. And so um, the thing that I, that I love about that quote is that what Luther meant was then, so we fall on God's grace. Yeah. We, we go with what um, the best we can with what, what he's given us with what we understand of his will and, and we fall on his grace. And this is probably a, a great area to emphasize that as well. Right. Because I mean, even if I made just only good choices, all my righteous deeds would still be as filthy rags before the Lord. I think that's in the book there somewhere. Right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so in talking with your friends about this, I, I think it's just really important to do. I think the couple of things we we focused on one um, acknowledge from their position that that is of value and is of value to you as well. It's just not as of value as, as the sanctity of life, as, as the gift of life that God gives to each and every human on the planet. Right. And I think too, uh, maybe even there's, there's some after discussion that, that gets thrown back in our face. Well, if all you care about is, is um, life, but you don't care about the, the life of the baby and the mom together after they're born, you don't mm-hmm. offer aid, you don't offer help. Is there a place where we can start to speak to this too? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's that's such an important one because because um, I don't think uh, I don't know what you think, but I don't think that's without merit. Um, you can find a lot of people who who are vehemently against uh, abortion, but but there's nothing no no skin in the game do they have towards uh, helping those then who've who've uh, decided to uh, keep their babies, but but need help you know raising yeah. them, whether it's uh, adoption agencies, whether it's um, just care for unwed mothers. Um, there's so many different things. One of my favorite organizations, uh, we actually have a guy in our uh, church who builds, um, works for a company who builds the, the buses for him is a group called Save the Storks. Mm-hmm. Um, you can look them up at savethestorks.com and they provide um, clinics that sit outside of like Planned Parenthood and offer alternatives for the people who, oh, wow. who show there. They don't go protest. They don't do anything. They just do ultrasounds, let the let the women see the baby, right? Um, yeah. He um, gives them all their options kind of thing. Um, and so, it, yeah, all these things are supportive. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll confess to myself, like I, my wife and I, um, you know, talked about doing foster and adoption for like maybe 30 minutes. And I, I never thought myself to be someone who could do it. Um, my, uh, my niece is adopted and uh, she was placed in my, uh, my wife's sister's home the day after she was born in foster care and looking back on it now, I actually realized that I, uh, when we didn't know if they would keep her, I was sort of keeping her emotionally at arm's length. Um, I can look back now and, and realize that I was afraid of falling in love with her and having her be, be taken. Um, but, but even those type of attitudes have to be adjusted if we're going to, if we're going to be supportive yeah. in the right way in this issue. Yeah, I mean, so we, we can recognize, and I know it, it's sort of a loaded term, uh, but there is a certain degree of, of, of privilege that comes with, I can say I, I am against a, a decision that somebody else would have to make, right. but I also don't have to deal with the fallout for the next 18 years of it. Um, and so to talk about this, even just sort of on the periphery, there's there's mental care and spiritual care as well as oh, yeah, physical yeah, and financial yeah. that needs to go along with this. And so it, it's good to sort of make a, a a case for life, but also that, that means then how can we, how can we help with all of the burdens that come from this? Because they're going to be severe, no matter what, if, if sin breaks stuff, then ours should be always an approach of compassion, always an approach of, of help and love for our neighbor. Yep. Coming to bring proclamation of good news to all of those who are in need. Um, and, uh, yeah, we don't always do a great job of, of, um, that along the way so it's a it's a chance for us to to find some repentance though and, and to sort of reevaluate again how we're talking to our neighbors about this that they, they, we're trying to help not win and that means it, it's not about us always looking good and, and maybe we can do better but in all of it like you said it, it's, it's about the gospel uh, pointing to, to the gifts that god would give and a value of human life ascribed to this so that as we we approach uh, this very important issue we can always make a call for hope 
Yep. And in fact, probably one of the most powerful things um, and opportunities is actually having a discussion and moving beyond just holding up a sign about it or posting something on social media about it and then swiping and going on with your day, you know, actually having a conversation with your friends and then realizing you can still be friends afterwards and you still both have the hope that Christ gives us in his word. I love it. Pastor Jeremy Jacoby is pastor of Summit of Peace Lutheran Church. Uh, Thank you again so much for being here with us in the drive school. Absolutely. See you guys later.